Welcome to the show that looks at truth, fiction, and reality with a smirk. I'm Aaron Peterson. I'm Amanda Sink. And I'm Zach Parkerson. And welcome to Smirk. Each week, one of our hosts introduces an original story, which we then use as a springboard for spirited and lighthearted discussion on whatever the moral or theme is. Last week, we had the, or the last episode, we had the joy of Zach, the upbeat, solemn, slumlord lifestyle of uh, Zach Parkerson. This week, we've got Amanda Sink. So, Amanda, what are we going to be doing this week? Wow, I feel like I have to really like up the ante now with that introduction and like really putting Zach on a bottom totem pole situation. It wasn't here. about it. It was an interesting conversation. I'm just saying it was it was it was dark. There were there were demons or something. He does go dark uh, or something. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is, is is about what we're all probably we what something we could potentially fear happening in our lifetimes, which would be horrible, and also something that we're all thinking about right now, but in a good way. Oh, about how they really messed up the last season of Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's exactly okay. it. How did you know? I can't get it out of my mind. Zach, let's uh, let's take a stab at this before she tells her story. Let's see if we can get oh close. Okay, You're so she said these to. are. This is what we're all thinking about, right? And what was the other part of it? Well, it's more of an activity, something that we're all probably doing right now. Okay. So Zach, we're thinking about doing. Thinking about doing. We're all thinking about doing. And it's something that we could fear being taken away from us. Okay. Zach, take a stab at this. What do you what do you think of the topic's gonna end up being? I can only think of naughty things. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're thinking about doing when recording a podcast? Yes, of course. When I hear both of your dulcet tones, weird. I just, That's very weird. It, it's weird. I'm about to yeah. get. I'm about to get James Gunn for that joke. All right. I, uh, I assume COVID is a COVID. No. Well, don't spoil Amanda. Oh, you can't. Amanda can't tell us yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe. <laughs> I'm glad it's not. Man, if I have to hear one more podcast talk about COVID nineteen, I'll lose it. It's not. No, it's not anything about that. Yeah, I would probably guess our freedoms being taken away because of too much government control. That's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, you tell the man. That's what's up. Well, let's find out. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's find out. Let's, let's hear, hear the a story. story. Today we began renovating our outdoor barn that came with the land and house we purchased. I remember hearing in my classes about this horrible time back in the early 2000s where this man took control of the country with everyone's permission and made people their slaves, but only the poor people. He took their money, land, everything, and books were even outlawed. It was really bad. And the people that helped him, he let them be free. Most of them died before he did, but there was one woman who saved the rest. No one really knows how. I mean, there's rumors, but... That's all they are, you know. So anyway, as I was tearing apart this barn, I found this book. I started reading through it and thought it was fake, but I thought it might be real. It made me decide after reading, I want to record myself making a diary using my hologram replicator. Here's my favorite page. May 3rd. You watch too much TV. Go read a book. I haven't heard that being said in a long while. No one makes that suggestion anymore, or else you'd lose a limb. Or worse. We've been enslaved to these people for what feels like centuries, but I can't be. Not if I can remember my life without this. They're horrible to us, and the scars on my body could tell you that story. You'd think we were responsible for something bad happening to them, but all we've ever done is be alive at the wrong time. The man in charge, they believe he saved us all, but that's because they've still got everything they need. He did help, though, for a little bit. Our country was in ruins, absolutely just crumbling to pieces. He found a way to privatize electricity through his company and gave that commodity away for free to the public using a government grant. Good way to get people on your side, huh? Yeah, well, those same people Dimitri was helping are the same people he inevitably took advantage of. The poor, the impoverished, the everyday people. He was smart. 
He knew he could wrap everyone around his finger, which included every military leader of every branch, and they all bowed at his feet. His dictatorship has reigned for far too long, but those who helped him get here, he gave back to, so the rest of us are just stuck. I had a friend, his name was Stud, because he was the worst carpenter you'd ever meet. He never once actually found it, the Stud. Anyway, he used to read a lot too, we were always those bookworms everyone made fun of, and he told me about this book that's out there with only a few remaining copies to be found. And in it lies the truth about Dimitri. Enough to change the way people think of him. Enough to free us. It's been eight months since Stud told me that and mysteriously disappeared, but I think I found a copy. I have it hidden in the wall. They've broken down anyway, so it makes for good hiding spots. That's where I keep this diary for safekeeping. If I can read it and set us free, I'm going to do it. No matter what it takes, Val. So that's her name, Val. She's my new hero. She's the reason I can read this and the reason I'm going to start telling stories when I get older. She saved so many people and I can't wait to show this book to my parents and everyone else. She gave life back to everyone. Goose goose for ba. (laughs) Goose for ba. So what's your initial takeaways from it? What do you think the moral is? Politics. Okay, Aaron? Don't give, don't put too much faith in uh, one people of government. You know what I'm saying? Because the government, you can't trust them because they're going to come. They're going to take your stuff. Dusty Alrighty. Dania. Yes. <laughs> so basically, it's either the Hitler life story, the Putin life story, or a number of other dictators throughout times. Or a future yet to be written. Ah. That's true. Once you learn to read, you will forever be free. Well, that is very true. I mean, there, there's a reason why they wanted to abolish reading in many cultures and every time a dictator is in charge that's why they try to discount reading and news (laughs) not the more you can keep people uneducated the less they can think for themselves it's true the christian faith during the crusades burn all the books (laughs) well it's true that that happened yeah that happened i mean it might be shots fired but it's still accurate (laughs) (laughs) i can't rewrite history yeah some have tried. Some have, but yes, I refuse no. to ever like jump on a boat where you ignore history. You you have to accept the truth of history. You don't True. just hide from it. You won't learn otherwise. So my first question for you both is, what's the first book that warmed your heart, inspired you, or the first one that you considered to be your favorite? Oh. Big ask. That's a big ask. Easy. Oh, I guess he knows right off the top of his head. <laughs> the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle. That was the the first one. As soon as I read that as a as a kid, it just spoke to me and kind of spoke to how I I look at things, where I try to assess things and pay attention to my surroundings and observe and observe and observe. I think that's very very important to understanding people, to understanding your situation, to understanding where you're at with any situation and who you are. So it, it was a very important book for me. Now, was that book important to you in the fact that it helped reaffirm what you already believed as a child, like the way that you operated, or did it help build you into being more of an observer? No, that's just how I thought. So it was like the first book that really spoke to who I am. So it understood you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's weird to look at it. It was a, it was a book that I could read and I understood that character's point of view. I could understand exactly what they were looking for. They were very, you know, Sherlock Holmes in in the written form in literature is actually a very troubled individual. You know, he struggles with many things, but he's very perceptive. He's very acute. He pays attention to detail. And I try to do those things. And obviously I did it, you know, more when I was younger, probably than you do as you get older, because as you get older, you get a little bit more lax in certain behaviors. But um, it, it really just kind of gave purpose to my to who I thought I was and and reading really helped in, enforce that reading those stories helped enforce that, that oh this this is a character that gets it I never really cared so much about solving the crimes it was really just about how the crimes were solved what about you Zach I know you, you said that it was kind of a difficult decision for you too many favorites or something well yeah I mean you're asking you gotta remember when I was a kid that's absurd yeah, uh, that was ages ago. When did, <laughs> when did the Lord of the Rings movie come out? Was it where it was like 2001? Is that right? Early 2000s, yeah. Yep, something like that. I'm trying to place. 
I think, and I had to quickly Google to remember the name, but I think the first book I remember truly like falling in love with was Star Wars Vector Prime, the the uh, Star Wars novel infamous for killing Chewbacca. Oh, I've heard of that. That's the first one. one I can remember. They killed Chewbacca because yeah, Han, Han and Leia's son Anakin uh, didn't wait long enough on the Falcon for pulling off a planet that was exploding. Left left Chewbacca to die because he was too afraid to wait. Daddy wasn't pleased. Was it a total fake out? And then five minutes later, we learn he's not really dead. <laughs> no, no, Chewbacca, Chewbacca was dead. <laughs> the fan base was riled. My uncle Jeff was a. The fellow that really introduced me to Star Wars as a child was livid, I remember. So that one, why why did that one resonate with you? Or what were you drawn to about it? Because he hated to shave, right? That's right. <laughs> and Chewbacca, I hated. He's so hairy. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same reason that I love like a Spider-Man novel or um, any kind of fiction. Like, it, you know, it. oh, there's more to this than what I already knew. You know what I mean? Like after that Spider-Man movie came out, there there were Spider-Man novels uh, that taught you more about about Spidey and his adventures. And Star Wars, yeah, that was like the first book, you know, and it had it had a story of Han, Luke, and Leia after the movie was over. And at the time, as a kid, I didn't I didn't know what canon was, so to me that was just gospel. Like, oh, this is what happens to Han after the movie. <laughs> you know, there was no. I did, there was no the internet also was younger, so there's no fandom debates going on. You just read a book and you enjoyed it, but it was yeah, it was cool to learn that there was more to it. And uh, you and then I, I remember like a weird story with that book where my teacher and I debated over the pronunciation of or if you put a or an in b- before the h uh, of a word. Okay, mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember having a debate with my teacher about that. And that was kind of fun. I remember there's like a lot of three PO if that memory serves in that story that I enjoyed. I don't know those books, and then later the comics and stuff kind of teach you that there was there was so much more to it, and it all. And when it you know it was fascinating that they're they're all written by different people, but they were all one story, which I thought was unique at the time. But then you know you learn about comics and stuff, and that's just kind of how universes are built. But it felt cool at the time. I think it's. I remember when I was younger and I read this or I had first heard about this book that my cousin had read and she was a couple years older than me and it sounded really horrible and yet fascinating and so I decided to read it and I'm sure you've heard of it and it's called A Child Called It and it's the story the author himself actually it's really horrible he was abused as a child pretty horrifically and it's uh, he has more than one book that tells his story, but it's about his time living in this home and the abuse that he endured and the emotions that he felt and, and the things that were going through his mind. And it was a really, it was very horrible, but it was also a beautiful way to capture the mind of people who are going through something so traumatic. And so I remember reading that and it just... It was a polarizing tale for me because my cousin was always very Christian and her household was very Christian and nobody was allowed to like watch anything that had to do uh, that was not like G rated. I mean, you couldn't even watch Harry Potter or Charmed or Buffy or anything like that. That was like you were in a cult if you were to try to watch it or get interest in any of those properties you're watching Buffy but to and read about and be like, abuse put down the, put down the swastika <laughs> yeah it was pretty bad and sh- to this day I think she's still never seen any of those things and to hear her reading about this story which to me that's like that's actual like that's something that actually happened to someone that's pretty horrifying and it was just bizarre that she was able to read that and so I was like well if she's allowed to, then I'm definitely allowed to. And so I read it and it was just something that not necessarily spoke to me in that I could relate to the level of horror that he felt, but just the just the feelings he was going through, the feelings of um, isolation and loneliness from a single parent and the things he was going through I could identify with. And it made me want to help people more in a different way than I had experienced up to that point in my life, obviously, because I was fairly young. And 
it's just one that's always stuck with me. And whenever I think about kids and I see parents and the way that they're parenting their children and I see how awful some of them are, I'm just reminded of this terrible story that's so true in so many different households across not just this nation, but in the world. And it's as bad as that is, it also helps remind me why we need to do more to help those kids that are stuck in a bad position. Like even though they might not be the best kids, they've you have to also consider the circumstances that they've been built around. And so yeah, I love that book for a lot of reasons. So what, what an interesting book to read as a child. Yeah, it it was bizarre that that was something that and that's why I was like, it can't be that bad if my cousin read it. But it was pretty brutal. Very brutal. I mean, like his family put him on top of a stove and turned it on and just burned his body while he laid on top of the stove. Maybe he was tanning. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> here's what I here's what I would say. You're speaking you're speaking about books. That shows how powerful books are and people perceive them in different ways. Like you you read and a book inspires you to to be to help people to to go and do other things based on whatever the reaction was. You know, I read I read a book and it, uh, it spoke to me because it helped me understand who I am as a person and and kind of why I do some of the things I do. Zach read it and it was more of an escape mechanism. So I mean, everybody reads for for various reasons. And by the way, I Zach, you mentioned comic books. I totally count comic books as books. I hate when people say that that doesn't count. It's literature. There's a lot of great stories in comic books and a lot of escapism, too. Um, so that's the fascinating thing, because reading, everybody reads for different reasons and they get different things from it, but it's just as powerful no matter what what the reasons are, just different ways. I think that's fascinating. And so that actually takes me to the next question that I wanted to ask you. How would your life change if you, like Val and the rest in her story and her time, were no longer able to read books, comics, literature, Facebook posts, whatever it is, you just couldn't read anything? Well, social media, honestly, I think would help people. If if you just force them to go back to books, I think that would really actually help because people don't. And and I don't say that like in a flippant way. Well, I kind I guess I kind of do, but I'm I mean it seriously. People don't read information anymore. They only read headlines, and a lot of that has to do because there's so much stuff. They're overwhelmed with content. There's just so many things. They don't have time. They don't want to read a whole article. They don't want to read a whole book. They want to just read the headlines, have a reaction, move on to the next thing, and they feel like that's their social circle. And I get that because a lot of people don't have a ton of friends and so they go online and they do have a ton of friends so you know that that matters so yes i think social media is is definitely a, a factor but in terms of of reading itself um no books no recipes no comics no subtitle i mean you wouldn't have you wouldn't be able to yeah, watch I, tv or I movies i would not want to live that life i mean really not that i couldn't go without Reading, I, I would actually be more hurt if I couldn't write because I'd rather the, the words come from, I, I want the words to come out of me just as much as I want them to go into me. Um, that sounded gross. <laughs> but That's what she said. In <laughs> terms of, of actual reading, I, I can't fathom not being able to gather information. I mean like real information. I don't, like I can't just click on, I can't just see a headline and think I know something. I actually have to research it. I just, I just. That's part of me. I have to know the facts behind something. I never form an opinion based on a headline or what somebody else tells me. My own mother could tell me something. I'm not basing an opinion on that. I'm going to go look at exactly what the details are. I mean, I might get a more, I might get a little more weight if I'm, you know, teetering if my mom has an opinion. But overall, I'm going to research it. I want to know what I think. And that's very important to me. So you can't read. You can't find a lot of that information out. Now, I guess you could still have news reports and whatnot. But, and I hate to... Nope, no reading. You're not allowed to read. News reports would not be reading. It'd be watching somebody report the news. So... But they're, this nah. is a time where they've taken everything away. Okay, well, you didn't say that. You said words. That's exactly... I said no me. no movies, TV, nothing like that. Oh, no movies or TV. Well, no, nah, no, nah, it's anarchy. I'm ready to riot. All of it's yeah, gone. Well, riot. Well, yeah, <laughs> now it's inescapable. Yeah, that's an inescapable torment. Yeah, I'm not, I thought you were just saying word, like written word. Wait, you know what's sad when you bring this up, and this is a, a a real truth. You know, we're sitting here in America, and we bitch about everything. Really, that's what we do. There are so many countries 
where that is an everyday fact of their life, where they actually have to live their life that way. And it's just, just think, just for, for one second fathom what it would be like if we didn't have Netflix and chill, if we didn't have Disney Plus, if we didn't have books, if we didn't have network TV, if we didn't have cable TV, if we didn't have any streaming TV, if we didn't have... Well, we don't have theaters currently, but if we, whenever we get them back, we don't have those. We don't have books. We don't have comic books. We don't have magazines. We don't have whatever. They don't. Are, they already don't have it because people are always wondering why they don't get up and leave. Why don't they get up and revolt? Why don't they get up and do this or that? Because you're you're conditioned. I mean, it's a condition. You, every, you can take everything away from you. You don't know how to fight back as much anymore. Right. And if you don't even know how, you know, if you're uneducated, which a lot of countries, again, um, those who are underneath the leadership that is in a dictatorship style, they don't want you to read and be educated because then you could potentially fight back. And so the more that they can just dominate you with as little information as possible for you to obtain, the less likely chance it is that you're going to be able to escape because you can't just Google, how do I escape? How do I get this or how do I do that? I'm going to find out. I'm going to go- I'm going to Google that and see if it works. <laughs> I mean, even a map, like if you don't know how to get to a certain place, you can't ask for people how to get there. You know, there's so many different factors that go into it that we don't think about because we would think, oh, if I was stuck in a city I didn't want to be stuck in, I would take a bus and I would leave the city or I would get in my car and leave. Okay, well, if you don't have that ability, you don't even know how to read a sign. How are you supposed to do that? <laughs> I mean, our lives would be so catastrophically different if we were left uneducated, if our upcoming generations were uneducated and couldn't read, if we lost access to any sort of written works, any sort of, you know, pop culture, escapism things like TV and um, any sort of entertainment, video games, magazines, things like that, we would we would be lost. We already are. <laughs> I, I mean, think. I mean, I hate to be, I hate to say it, but we're getting pretty close to it. Yeah, they're not taking those things away, but they're not honest anymore. I don't care which side of the aisle you you are on. There is media that is designed specifically to your point of view, right? And the other side of your aisle has media designed to their specific point of view. And there's not really much down the middle anymore. So it's it you're already reading and watching slanted material. So to me, that's the same thing as taking it away right. because it's dumbed down. Right. I mean, my my advice to anyone is uh, facing that kind of issue is challenge yourself by listening to, if you're, if you're a left-wing person, challenge yourself by listening to a right-wing podcast. Subscribe to it. Hear their point of view. That's what I, there are, there, <laughs> there are podcasts I listen to that I just hate every word coming out of their mouth. And I don't agree with the thing they're saying, but I think it's important to know where people are coming from. Otherwise, you do lose perspective entirely, hmm. and you and you divide and you divide, and that's how you get all this uh, this nonsense partisanship that's happening. Zach, how would your life change if you couldn't read anything or have access to entertainment? Well, the first the first thing I do when I wake up every morning is open the DC Universe app and read some comics, and the last thing I do before going to bed is open the Marvel Unlimited app. And read some comics. So without reading, I don't think I would do very well, to be honest. And then and then you expanded into movies and video games and stuff. Man, without video games, I think my life would be largely meaningless. Aww. Well, everybody has their hobbies and escapism. And when you take that away, like for Aaron right now, you, everybody took away his theaters. And so he's losing his mind. Yeah, I don't like they it. They took away my comic shops, man. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah, but right now, a lot of people's hobbies are taken away. Right now, or the last couple of months, I would argue it's more. I would argue it's more than hobbies. I think stories are the most powerful things humans have ever created. So, if you were to restrict and take away stories, then I mean, so- stories are what inspire you. They're what inspire armies to fight. You know, even like the story of the oppressive British government across the ocean. Like you rally those people because you tell them stories of the atrocities. Like stories are everything. That is true. Speaking of stories, if you were to write a book right now, or I guess for Zach, maybe it's a comic, what would it be about and why? Oh, I can answer that. A book, not a short story. Uh, The screenplay count, because that's what I'm working on. (laughs) Ah, 
yeah, sure. Yeah, that it, counts. It would be a book if I was writing a book because it's the same story. I got to get it out of my head or I'm not going to do it. Uh, it would be about, <laughs> it would be a spinoff of a smirk tale and it would be about a serial or a, a slasher in early 80s coming to kill a couple people on a farm. And that's about as much as I want to say about it. Go back and listen to the episode, right? Yeah, you can probably go find the episode. I think it's Happy Birthday, Billy. And that's essentially yep, the story, is. but much more expanded. Didn't that one come Let's out you... on Easter? No. Of like last year or something? I don't know. It's in there. Go. All you can scroll through. Happy birthday, Billy. Find it and you can listen no, to it. That's did. the story. He did an Easter murder tale, but that wasn't the one. Oh, a yeah. different one. Okay. I was going to say, I remember Easter having some horrific tale with it. Yeah, he likes to kill people on holidays. Yeah, there's got to be a new holiday coming up. <laughs> Mother's Day's coming up, so I'm going to be writing for that one. Perfect. Or Mother's Memorial Day. Mother's scare this year. Yeah, they could. You know, mothers aren't out there freaking out enough about the health of their children. They need a good scare. Oh, Scared boy. Scared straight. <laughs> Amanda, you're asking us to give away our stories for free here. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> Don't we do that on a bi-weekly basis? Kind of every other week we do that. Uh, but there, there is a story of... Um, Always wanted to tell uh, where it, a king would leave his lands to go find a cure for his dying wife, and then he would be he would be too late to find that cure because uh, he was too busy trying to save people along the way on other misadventures. Uh, he would end up cheating on his wife in this story, and then he would uh, he falls in love with the other lady, and then it, he would come back and uh, he would be too late. You would play into the the kingdom has actually been kept safe by his regent, and there's no shenanigans there. Uh, but he chooses to leave his kingdom anyway because he doesn't care. And when he leaves, he also takes with him a uh, magical sword, like a sword that's been passed down from king to king. It's the only sword that can kill magical creatures, essentially. Oh. And uh, he would find out he would find out that he has a bastard child coming from the woman on the side. And the book would end with him leaving. And then, well, it wouldn't be a book, actually. The story was originally designed as a video game. And then in the sequel, you would play as the son, trying to retrieve the sword to save the kingdom, etc. Interesting. And you would find out all kinds of, you would find out all kinds of things about uh, every... When you play as the son in the sequel, you would find out that every single party member the king was traveling with was a horrible person, and you would learn why. But in the first game, they would all, they would all appear to be heroes to the king. I like it. Thank you. I do too. Sounds interesting. Get that game made. <laughs> so magnum opus, man. <laughs> Sounds like it. Sounds like two well, games. Well, I, I'm not as creative as the two of you, where I am inspired to write fictional tales as much. But I think it would be really fun and probably rewarding to me if I could write a book of true stories of survival, like people who have gone through some remarkably probably traumatic or interesting stories and how their life, how they overcame that and where their life is afterwards. Because I feel like everyone has their own stories regarding that. Maybe it's something in childhood. Maybe they just grew up in bad areas and, you know, the chance of success for those individuals is pretty low. But here they are as like a CEO or, you know, own their own business or whatever it is. And being able to share kind of those glimmers of hope would be pretty cool. Sounds good. See, my, I don't want hope in my stories. We know. <laughs> we know. We are well aware <laughs> there is no concern of there is there is no fog in that uh, horizon for us. We get it very clear. Very yeah, definitely. Thank well, what do you think? Is my story truth or fiction? Truth. Well, I thought I would have thought truth, but she said something about a holographic projector diary, so I got to go with fiction. It is fiction. Some bitch. I appreciate that you thought that my story was written well enough that it could be true, though. I mean, you're talking about dictators. They're around. So, I mean, I get it. There have been a few. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, that's funny. it's not like they're not still prevalent all over the world. And no, people, we don't currently live in a dictatorship. But it can slide very quickly. It really can. So It can. Oh, it has to start with, you want to save the economy? We got to get rid of the old. And then things just go from there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's take it easy, brother. All right. Finally, what is the hey. title of your of your story? What's the title? The Outlaw. The Outlaw. The Outlaw being the books. Mm. Sure you don't want to rename it to The Outlaw King for SEO's sake? 
<laughs> what is, why would that? Because what it's is connected to Tiger King? King. And within the last couple oh. months, Tiger King <laughs> has been very, very promising <laughs> and prevalent in the society. Because that goddamn Carol yeah, Baskins. I feel like that just doesn't work as well. No, not at all. No, it was a joke. Can we can we talk outlaw, real? Hang on, hang on. Can we talk tigers? real quick about the idea that um, Zach, you haven't watched it, but this woman in this documentary is basically unflatteringly portrayed, and basically her name is being destroyed, and no one seems to care because the convicted felon didn't like her, and they're <laughs> on his side. And I just, for the life of me, can't understand. Well, no, no. This once, I'm not saying that there's not some merit to looking into her case. Okay. Maybe her husband disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Okay. But he's a convicted murder for hire dude. Agreed. So, he's not great either. They're both terrible. So maybe, maybe she hasn't been convicted of anything. She hasn't been charged with anything. And people are blatantly calling her murder on the internet. That concerns me in society when we we are. This is once again where we're going. People base their convictions on memes now instead of actual reading. True. Something True. to think about. Careers are absolutely destroyed because one thing is said about a person. I mean, you know, you are no longer innocent until proven guilty. You are absolutely guilty and must prove your innocence. There is no question. I think I have an idea for my next story. I think it's perfectly reasonable to consider them both not great people. You, that's what I. You can say whatever you want, and you can think whatever you want. That's that's the miracle of the freedom. But in the same token, he's convicted. He's got a bazillion pieces of information showing that he blatantly has tried to destroy this woman's life. She doesn't have anything really on film. Oh, I'm just saying because of the way she treated her tigers and locked them up in cages and was. I, like, I think her as an individual, she's not great. Okay. And, and that's, so that's, that's fair. where the hypocrisy is. And so is Tiger King. He's not great either. They're all awful. But I have my beliefs that, you know what? It seems like there is a little bit of a missing puzzle piece here about her husband. And the way she reacts to it is what's that's weird. slanted journal. That's not even journalism. It's a slanted documentary. No, it is. You're definitely they right. It is. How many but... documentaries have you ever seen where where the interviewer asks a question and they basically pause her face and let it hover on her in a very very incriminating manner? I mean, it's just so. <laughs> ominous. No, it's definitely slanted. I'm not saying it's slanted. What do you I think, think people when people say you kill your husband? It because it's oh. hilarious. <laughs> I don't know. If you what want someone think to I die, do? you just have to cover them in oil. What do they think? I smother <laughs> them in, in fish oil and feed them to tigers? It's silly. Well, this documentary sounds whack. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy. It's something. I kind of lost all judgment in America when uh, I found out that uh, Mike Tyson is a convicted rapist, but he is also beloved the nation over. To be fair, so. he did. He's a convicted rapist? Yeah, he is, and he, but he did serve his time, yeah. though. Yeah. He I, sure did. That doesn't change it. Yeah, well, it it does. It's weird that you get to, it's weird that you get to be beloved afterwards. I suppose it's true. Weird that no one really knows. How about that? So few. Oh, people that's know. extra weird. Yes, that's not true. I mean, I was there. I was around society when he was convicted. Everybody in the world knew that he was convicted. It's just they forgave him. I think him. he means now because he's a sports hero. People forgive sports heroes in a ridiculous manner. I mean, uh, what was his name? Kareem Hunt. They have a video of him whapping the shit out of a woman and in an um, elevator or whatever, or hallway or whatever it was. Yeah. And he's back now playing. No no worries. If I had a video of that, my job's not taking me back. McDonald's ain't taking you back. Mm -hmm. Nobody's taking you back. So it's, it's because we idolize sports heroes. That's a whole other podcast. We could go on for a while. Yeah. Let's do that. That would probably be explicit, I imagine. <laughs> Oopsie. All right. Well, as our show goes, we will occasionally pick listener stories to read and discuss on Smirk because we still believe you can read when you want to. If you'd like the chance to have yours read, email it <laughs> to my story at smirkpodcast.com. And if you like Smirk, please share the episode on your social media outlets. That's how people actually find the podcast. And guess what? Everybody's been making podcasts because they've been stuck at home. Every celebrity you've ever heard of now has a podcast. Joe Biden had a podcast. I don't know if it's still on, but he had one too. Everyone has one. Everyone, so help us out. Tell, tell your friends. Please, just tell them. Uh, and you can also subscribe to Smirk on your app of choice. Our website is smirkpodcast.com. 
And as you write your own life story, always remember to tell it with a smirk. So what do we what do you give America till readings banned? About 15, 20 months? Uh, banned? I don't know. I put 2068 <sighs> in the year for my story. Feels right. It doesn't feel right. Feels good. I, I, they can't take my comics from me, man. Would you revolt if they did? Or would you pout? I hope that I have the fortitude to revolt before it gets there. Zach's like, I would heavily pout and draw pictures of people revolting. Stick figure pictures. Right. I'd be a, I start being a graffiti artist. That's how I would revolt. <laughs> remember, remember the 5th of November. The gunpowder treason and plot. I know no reason where the gunpowder treason. That's a good movie. It's <laughs> a great movie. All right, we're done. Voila! In view, a humble vaudevillian veteran cast vicariously as both victim and villain by the vicissitudes of fate. This visage, no mere veneer of vanity, is a vestige of the Vox Populi, now vacant, vanish. <laughs> <laughs> it's. <laughs>